off too soon. How's everybody doing? Yeah? You need energy, so it's right. I get the great spot of after lunch when everybody's exhausted. So I'm going to try to up our energy. I'll do the best I can. Um, I'm here to kick your ass. Uh, that's my goal for today's presentation. Um, if I've done that, then I've done my job. So why this talk? Every year I develop a new talk, and I think a, a lot of my talks are based on my clients' pains, the current, current moment in time, what's happening. And as a consultant, um, there's two parts of my business. I help my clients think about the future and plan for how, where they go, what's next, how to evolve their business. And I love doing that. That's my favorite part of my business. The other half of my business, not so much. I do a lot of troubleshooting. I spend a lot of time solving my clients' problems and firefighting. And I'm sort of sick of it. And so I'm going to try to solve all your problems with clients in the next 20 minutes. Um, and so let me start by saying, yes, I know there are asshole clients. Right? Yes, clients are assholes. I'm going to let's all agree. Do we agree? OK, so we all agree. So now we have to take the blame off them. It's our fault. Just like your spouse and the person you fall in love with, you cannot change them, right? I've tried with my husband. It hasn't worked very well. So we can't change our clients. We only can change our behavior and how we better manage our clients. Does, that, does everybody feel good with that? So we're going to learn how to better to up, up, our, up, up our game and how we manage our clients. Um, and uh, the other thing is that uh, I feel like we act as individuals rather than an industry. And a lot of the things that we're doing currently to our business and to our industry are hurting not only ourselves, but everybody that uh, is in our industry, everybody that's in the creative space. So one person does something that's unethical, or does something that, or behaves badly with a client, that reflects on all of us. And I want to see if we can all just agree that we need to crack, create better business practices that reflect really well on our industry and make us look damn great, because we are damn great, right? We are awesome, but our clients need to know that and do it, and we have to do a better job of that. So that's the kind of goal of my talk, is to kick your butts into gear. So first, I'm going to tell you, I know your pain. Um, and these are the things I, there's so many things I hear about and that you blame your clients for, but I'll give you the ones that I hear most often. They don't respect our time. I'm hoping I'm going to see, hear some amens after this. Uh, they don't respect our time. They give us two weeks to do a logo. They give us three weeks to do a website and launch it. Right? Uh, they don't respect our time. Again, it's they. They don't understand our value. They think of us as a pair of hands. We charge by the hour. We do things that they simply don't understand, and they don't understand what we do. And they think all we do is have fun all day. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, they have an unruly organizational structure, so we blame our clients a lot of times by saying, it's designed by committee. Matter of fact, we just had, um, we did the, uh, the lunchtime roundtables, and at, the, at our talk, that was a big conversation, like how to wrangle all these stakeholders, right? And not complain about it, but figure out a better way to manage them. Does this all sound familiar to you? They don't live up to their end of the bargain, so clients promise the world and give you nothing. Right? They say they'll give you content on time, they don't. They say they'll proofread, they don't. They tell you they have the rights to the imagery, they don't. <laughs> I, I get it. I've heard these stories for 30 years. I've been in the industry long enough to know these things. Um, they art direct us, big one, right? <laughs> now I'm hearing it, OK. <laughs> now we're getting the energy up. Is it the art directors or the illustrations? I don't know. What are you laughing at? <laughs> it's the fuck my life thing, I think it's. <laughs> OK. Um, they will know it when they see it. Right? How many times do you hear that? So there's lots of other ones. I could do a whole slide presentation on things we blame our clients for. But I want to say, let's move beyond that. So when a client complains, I want you to think about some of the strategies I'm presenting today. And I'm hoping they'll help you manage your clients better and manage your life better. Um, and already I'm having a type problem. <laughs> I am not a designer. I used to be. I went to design school, so I should know better. And it looked good before during the practice time, so I apologize. 
Don't, don't criticize my, my, my kerning. OK. <laughs> but you will, so it's cool. So if you want to tweet it now, get it out of your system. <laughs> I won't take it personally. OK, so the most important strategy, if you go away with one thing, and if you get bored the rest of the talk, listen to this, which is you need to know who you are as an individual, who your department is, who your firm is, and what kind of clients you want to work for. You need to define that. You need to envision that. You need to plan for that. If you don't do those things, if you don't think proactively and think about who you want to be when you grow up, and who do you want to work with? What kinds of people do you want to surround yourself with? Then you are going to make decisions. And this is why a lot of times we're in the trouble we are and why we're firefighting is we make decisions based on the latest fire or the latest trouble. And we're not making decisions smartly enough based on our long-term vision. And guys, I know designers don't like planning. I get that. You know, we want to be spontaneous and go with the flow and pivot and change and you know, go with the latest trend. And that's cool. You can do that. I give you permission. It doesn't mean you can't plan. You can plan and you can change. Right? But I do think we need to know as individuals, as a company, or as, as, as a team, who we are. And then we can make smarter decisions about how we manage our clients and what kinds of clients we work for and what kind of team we want to surround ourselves with. OK, uh, so be, re be proactive. Read those red flags. They are standing you, staring you right in the face. But somehow, we don't read them. We're so excited about two things. Either the client wants to work with us, and we're like, oh, the client wants to work with us. That's awesome. right? And so we're so excited they want to work with us, or we get so excited about the project or the business that they're working in, or we're just so burned out, we just don't read the red flags. So pay attention to those red flags. They are staring you right in the face, like I said. You know, there are things that they don't come to meetings on time. Hello, that's going to be a problem later on in the relationship. They, we're going to deliver you the creative brief before the project started, and they don't. They didn't show up to a meeting. They don't spend, you know, they spent two hours explaining something that they could have spent half an hour explaining. These are red flags. And so you just need to read those red flags, count them, charge more. My general rule of thumb is every time you see one red flag, you charge 10% more. <laughs> so for each red flag, you just increase your fee 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%. Works brilliantly. It's a great pricing strategy. Um, but even if you're in-house, read those red flags and then figure out how to mitigate those before they happen. So for instance, my red flag is, and this is a silly one, but it's important to me. I'm a New Yorker. I don't know if you notice. <laughs> I speak really fast. Not sure you notice. Also, I have 20 minutes, so that's another reason I'm speaking fast. Um, and so my red flag, working with my clients, is if they speak slow. <laughs> it drives me crazy. I'm like, get to the damn point. I'm a, I, I need to know. What's your problem? I want to solve it. Right? I don't need to know about your family, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> I just want to help you, right? And that's why I'm like, that's not really a nice red flag to have, but it is mine. It drives me crazy. And so if somebody takes a long time to explain something, I tell them on the phone, look, can you get to the point? <laughs> or I am an impatient person. Like, I just level set it. And so they know. And I also say it whenever I speak. So when people want to work with me, they know they have to speak a little bit faster <laughs> and get to the point. But whatever your red flags are, read them. And, just, and be proactive about it and create systems and tools that will help you mitigate those problems right away. So just pay attention. Then we have to, and I think this is something that we do as an industry that is, I think, problematic for us. We're not communicating our value enough. And when I say value, I'm talking metrics. ROI, do you guys hate that word? Return on investment, right? We need to show through numbers, through data, through both qualitative and quantitative ways, how we as creative profession are moving the needle. I'm sorry I'm using these words. I feel like such a corporate hack. Uh, I'm actually not. I went to design school. I just want to emphasize that. <laughs> uh, um, so I think we need to develop more case studies, uncover the stories that make us sound and look like we know what the hell we're doing, because we do. Right? So develop, every time you complete a project, develop case studies that don't talk about how I chose these images and why these images are chosen and why this color palette reflects this mood or whatever. Uh, you really want to say, this event, inc I increased attendance at this event by this percentage. 
I increased brand awareness by this percentage. It got this kind of level of media attention. So we need to prove our value in any way we can. And it might not be metrics, it might be some other way, like through client testimonials. Any way that we can prove that we have really affected change and that design matters. Design, I'm, I'm, why do I need to tell you guys you know that? I'm hoping. Uh, then the other thing is we have to be advisory. So when our clients are misbehaving, we should be, a, be identifying ways we can help them rather than blame them. So if they're not getting us the content on time, can we offer writing services? Can we recommend a writer that we, we work with? How can we upsell our services and be more advisory to identify those moments where we could really be strategists rather than a pair of hands? And it's not even when clients are misbehaving. At all opportunities, we should be looking at our clients and saying, how can we even help them further? And I don't think we're doing that enough. By just telling them, here's a problem we think you have, and here's how we think we can solve it. Clients want that. They need it. And that shows that we're, we have value, and we're strategists, and we think we're thinkers. We're not just a pair of hands. So I, I really tell my clients to try to be as more, more advisory Again, this is all about firefighting. We're so exhausted. Everything's going so fast. We don't have time to think. But you should make some time to think, how can I help my clients better? How can I solve their problems? And the other thing, I, and I use this expression quite a lot in almost all my talks, is I, I'm a really big believer in building the love. And what I mean by that is make sure that your clients adore you. Absolutely adore you. Be a good human being. Be likable, care about them. So when I say I don't care about their families, I absolutely care about their families. But not when we're talking about business. So I usually try to get to know them in person. And I recommend if you have clients that you've never met, even in, vir in this virtual world, there's a thing called Skype and Google Chat. There's lots of ways you can meet people in person, even if it's on the video, right, online. Try to make that personal connection and build that love and that trust because relationships will be so much smoother if they just know you as a human being. They realize you have kids, you have dogs, right? You have a life. And you care about their life. So I'm really, I'm a big believer in building the love to make sure that you have a one-to-one -one relationship with everybody you work with and really get to know them and, to, and for them to get to know you. So um, I'm always telling people when I meet them, who I am as a human being. So I always say, and I name my book this, Brutally Honest, because I always tell people, look, I'm brutally honest, and it's like I'm very direct, and I'm going to tell you the truth, but I do it with love. Right? So they know right away that I'm going to hurt them, and I'm going to maybe make them be mad at me for a while, but I'm doing that with the best intentions. And I do it. I do with the best intentions, but I care about their lives. Right? So I was on vacation in Australia. I just literally came back to New from New Zealand. 24-hour flight, three flights on Wednesday. So I'm a little tired. <laughs> and when I was there, um, I remembered one of my clients was having surgery. So I texted her, while, and I told all my clients I'd be offline to see how she was doing, because I really was worried about her. I was authentically worried about her. She was so happy, I asked, that I cared. Right? It made a huge difference. And I didn't do that for, to build the love. I did it because I actually really did care about her. But I want to know how it went. So build that love. Pay attention to your clients. Know when they're having babies. Know when they're having struggles in their life. Understand that those pains might be reflected in how they talk to you or those successes. So build the love. And then, here's another thing creators do. You over-deliver, right? We're constantly over -deliver. We give them more concepts. We give them more revisions. And then we get, and, but we don't tell them. And then we get mad when they keep pushing it. But we haven't told them that we over-delivered. So a simple solution is to say, hey, you want this, this additional concept? That's cool. I'm going to throw that in. I understand. I, I understand that we need to do one more direction to make sure that you understand you know, to solve this problem or whatever. But then, then you've laid the stage to say, look, I have been generous. I've already given you something for free or something out of scope or out of the schedule. I'm happy to give that to you. But the next time I will need to, there will be some consequences. right? So I, how many of you have um, dogs and kids? Cats don't count. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, cat lovers. But you know, like dogs and kids, they love you, right? So you built the love. They absolutely adore you, right? I'm hoping. 
This is the goal, that your kids are going to love you uh, and your dogs. Uh, but you still have to give them structure and consequences, right? And they still love you. That's the same thing with clients. <laughs> so if you built the love and you've given them a structure, I promise you, I almost guarantee you, they will still love you. Don't be afraid of, afraid of providing consequences. Um, is it possible I only have 34 seconds left? <laughs> Holy shit, okay. <laughs> I'll be faster. Lead by example. We have to show good behavior. If we misbehave, our clients going to misbehave. So, creatives, you are so proud of this, and I don't know why, that you have an, uh, like an email um, an inbox that has never, like you have 10,000 emails that you haven't responded to. And you're proud of it. You tweet it, like, I have 10,000, and they show screenshots of all the emails that they haven't responded to. I don't understand that. You should respond to emails. You should have a zero inbox. because. You need to learn, do you need to show the clients, I care about you, and your vendors and your staff, and you respond immediately. Then your clients are going to respond immediately. If you don't respond immediately, they're not going to respond immediately. You behave better, they'll behave better. So lead by example. Seems obvious. This stuff seems obvious. Am I kind of being too obvious? But these are things that you guys don't do, or some of you don't do all of these things. Yes, you can be empathetic. So I have to put this in because everybody likes to be empathetic. I get that, and we should. But don't be a pushover. Being an empathetic person does not mean you need to be a pushover. And we're sort of creatives are a lot more about being pushed over. Like we like being pushed over all the time. I don't know if we like it, we thrive in it. Right? So stop being pushovers. Stand up for yourselves. Am I yelling enough? I should get madder. <laughs> okay. You need to have clearly defined process. Not every single time do you do a project that you need to create the world again. If you know how you work, it'll go faster, and clients will better manage themselves because they know your process. This is how I work. These are the stages. This is the, how many deliverables I give you. You show it to them. You refer back to it always as a document. This is how we work together. They will love it. So have some more processes. Take the time to develop this stuff. It's really important. Um, document everything. So everything should be in writing. Everything should be agreed upon. So anytime you have a meeting, send them meeting notes. And then keep those notes in some sort of file or on your computer. And then when you're in a meeting, refer back to them. So a lot of us write notes, create a brief, strategy documents, right? Have you seen strategy briefs that are like 30 pages long or 50 pages long? And then people forget about them and they make decisions later on that have nothing to do with the strategy. Bring that strategy with you. Refer back to the strategy. Bring, those, bring the proposals, bring the contracts with you at all times. Remind them of all the things you agreed on. I don't think we do that enough either. So start doing that. Um, OK, this is my personal pet peeve at this very moment. Uh, I don't know if anybody's getting this, but I'm seeing this on a daily basis. Contracts from clients that come into my clients, to, to the creatives I work with, that tell the creatives that they are not allowed to show the work they do. Does this sound familiar? And we're signing these to contracts. We should stop signing these contracts. I don't care if the project's $100,000 or more. That is hurting our industry. If we cannot show the work that we do or use our client's name to promote ourselves, how do we demonstrate our value? How do we get new clients? This is how we get new business, by showing the work we do and by talking about the clients we work for. If we cannot show that work or talk about the clients, it's a problem. And now that more, I think a lot of creatives don't read contracts, and I wish I was as brave as Liz to name some people on stage. And I could, cause, but some of them are speakers. Uh, <laughs> so ask me later and I'll tell you. Uh, but there are so many firms, big names, that are signing these contracts that are not so where they can't promote the work. And the more we sign these contracts, the more that's hurting our industry as a whole. And we need to stand up to our clients now to stop this from happening. And if you work in-house, you need to talk to your legal team to have them stop sending those contracts to agencies. You need to work for our industry overall to prevent these kinds of contracts from happening. So read, our, read your contracts. They're not that hard to read. Just avoid the where-ofs, therefores, and shall-ofs. Just completely ignore those. Um, sorry to the lawyers in the room. Okay, there's one or two. 
<laughs> Retain your rights to self-promote. Read your contracts. And then communicate. So I always, every time I, pre I present, almost all, my, almost all my topics, I always end up with what's the magic answer to all your problems. The magic answer to all your problems is to communicate. I don't know how many times I say on a phone call, on a daily basis, did you tell the client? They'll tell me the problem. My clients, my design clients will tell me the problem that they're having. And I'm like, did you tell the client? And they're like, oh, no. First, tell them that you're having a challenge or that they're misbehaving. Start with the honest damn truth. Right? They don't know what they're doing wrong. They really don't. They're just as stressed as you are. They're just as busy as you are. They have a lot of pressures as well. And they're misbehaving for a reason. Unless they're pure assholes. I mean, you can't do anything about that. Um, so communicate more and more often as much as possible in person. I'm a big believer in honesty. I don't think I, in my entire life with every recommendation I've ever given to my clients has ever backfired. People appreciate you just telling them the truth. Right, so if they're misbehaving, saying, I'm having a challenge with this. Here's how I think we, here's how we as a team can do better. Here's what I need from your team. Right, the one thing about being honest, and that I've learned this over the years, is never to finger point. So I never say it's your fault or you did this. I learned this from dealing with my husband, or him dealing with me. <laughs> so you can learn a lot from marriage. <laughs> um, but if you're honest and you don't finger point, you don't blame them, but you say the situation is untenable, we need to figure this out, or the schedule is you know, incredibly tight, we need to figure this out, they'll work with you. At least that you've told them that they're misbehaving or that there are challenges. So just be honest and communicate. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Embrace conflict. You guys are conflict avoiders, like the plague. You know, I think conflict is cool. You should learn to embrace it. Because life is about conflict. And it's OK. Conflict is not a bad thing if we can resolve it. It's only bad when it's festering and unresolved. So embrace conflict. Understand that there's going to always be conflict and just deal with it and say, OK, what is the challenge? How can I fix it? How can I change what is happening? Can I change it? And if I can't, learn to say no. That's my other magic word. I love the word no. And it's not a yes. You know, a lot of people talk about no is, turn the no into a yes. No, a no is a no. <laughs> right? You're using the no only when you've done everything you possibly can to prevent it from happening, to get better. At some point, you need to say no. No to a project, no to a client, no to misbehaving, no to anything that is going to damage where your long-term vision is, the health of your company, your health. No is a powerful word. It should use, be used selectively, but it has incredible impact. I do a whole talk about no, and I'm going to summarize it in one way, which is the way to say no is this, no. Which is, don't kind of explain it by no, I'm sorry, you know, no with a smiley face, right? It's no. There's a lot of steps in between that. But ultimately, you really just want to say no. And it, can you imagine, have you ever done this before where you say no to somebody? Just they're talking, they're like, I need this for tomorrow. And you say, uh, no. <laughs> and they, right? They're like, what? <laughs> And it, it sounds more powerful, and then you can explain why. But breathe. Say no, and then breathe. And amazingly enough, they'll listen. So that's how you say no. So if you do all these things, and there's so many other, I only had 20 minutes, so there's only so much time I have. Um, I actually might be early. I'm very confused by this clock. <laughs> Does anybody know how long I have? OK, I'll just keep talking until somebody shows up. <laughs> Even though I know, I heard on Twitter that you're really mad when speakers speak over. <laughs> Stefan, you're, you're being pointed out right now. OK. <laughs> so the benefits. The benefits of better managing clients and stop blaming them. There's a lot of benefits. Here's just a few. 
higher prices. We can charge more because they respect us and they value us and they're willing to pay for it because they love you. You've built the love, you've better managed them, they be, you're showing the value, you've helped their business grow or develop or make a difference, right? So you can charge more for that. Wouldn't that be great? We can do that. Clients that value our input and advice, they listen to us. They actually care about what we think and they listen and they act on it. That happens when you're advisory and when you built the love and they come and you've, you've demonstrated a value. It's all related. You have a longer term, really, excuse <clears throat> me. You have longer term relationships. Now I know, clients are coming back to you already, but sometimes that's a red flag to me. They're coming back to you because they're working all over you and they know they can take advantage of you. I like long term relationships where they value you. So they're not just giving you the email blast or a social media like tweet that you have to put out. It's very much like I have a strategic project, I need your appointment. You know, they're giving you higher level, higher paid, uh, more time to do things. You get better projects overall. So one of the things I talk a lot about is I think the industry is going into two different directions now. I almost feel like we're two different industries at this point, where what I like to call executioners, right? Those are the people, and there's a lot of work in this space. Almost all the work we do is in this space, which is execution, which is like, I need this email blast, and I need it next week. It's like, I need to tell you what to do, and you go do it, right? So it's a lot about churn and burn. And there is a lot of work in that space. And you can make a lot of money in that space, but it's extremely about turn and burn. It's turn and burn. It's not about like strategy and your value. It's really much, I need this done. Can you do it? Do it. But then the other part of the industry, and I think that's where a lot of you want to be, is from what I'm hearing, is you want to be strategists. You want to be those people they go to when they need top level advice, when they don't just need an email blast, but they need the strategy behind that. They need the content. They need the thinking. They need the UX. They need all of it and they want your brilliance and your mindset because they trust and value you. So you'll have higher quality projects and your work will be more in the strategic area than in the executional area. And that's the same with in-house teams. I've changed in-house teams when I've worked with them to, to, to be more strategic if the company needs it. How do we do that? How do we stop being just executioners and really be more strategists? Um, you'll eventually, and this is the best part, have less hassle and less revision you'll essentially be a happier human being, right? And don't we all want to be happier? At least I do. Okay, so I wrote this book. It's called Brutally Honest, uh, uh, No Bullshit Business Strategies to Evolve Your Creative Business. It's out in the bookstore. I'm, I'm doing book signings tomorrow, I think at 12.30. Um, if you have questions, come to me and talk to me. I'm really approachable. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you.